Hello and welcome everybody to the New Look Mashroom Show, the place to come for landlords, for help and advice with insurance, tenant finding, mortgages, rent collection and a whole lot more. I'm Rob Smith and top of the agenda for this edition are the new rules which could potentially cost the rental industry as much as £16 billion over the next few years. We'll also be looking at how the latest energy price increases are likely to impact the sector and we'll be talking about mortgage deals and the fact that record numbers of them have been withdrawn by banks and building societies in recent days because of rate rise fears. Our main guest is energy efficiency expert James Tanner. James, thanks very much for being with us. And we've also got our regular expert team in our Q&A box who will be taking your questions throughout. Now, given that the energy price increases affect ev everybody and that landlords are going to have to dig deep potentially if they're going to meet the uh, proposed higher EPC standards and at a time when there are serious concerns about tenants ability to keep paying their rent as well as their bills then there's plenty of issues for us to get stuck into. Don't forget you can follow Mashroom any number of different ways on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and you can find our uh, private Facebook community where you can share your experiences, ask questions and get the support and answers that you need. We'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar as well as a review request. So we'll really appreciate you taking the time to leave us a review. If our conversation sparks an idea or a question that you want to share, then do that via the Facebook community page. Our expert team will be responding until five o'clock. Loads to get stuck into. So without further ado, let's get started. We're talking about the EPC, the Energy Performance Certificate and that the government is potentially going to change the rules for landlords, meaning that sometime in 2025, the minimum EPC rating that's required to rent out your property could go up to C. Upgrading properties to meet that new target is going to potentially be expensive. It's estimated that the overall cost to the landlord industry could be as much as £16 billion. Pounds. Well, I'm joined by James Tanner, who's an energy and efficiency expert for landlords and homeowners. Also, you're a full-time professional landlord yourself, aren't you? Yes, I am. Right, OK. So he knows what he's talking about. He can actually answer the questions properly for us. Um, so let's start from the, the very beginning. Why are these potential EPC changes going to be coming in? Well, before we get on to the financial aspects of, of, of all this, I just wanted to put it into context. So the whole world has come together and has, a, has agreed to aim for a net zero target by 2050. In order to meet that, it's very important that the housing stock is improved and becomes much more energy efficient. So that's why the government proposed an EPC of C. 25% of all the energy used in the UK is from buildings, mainly from heating and hot water. Okay, so there's a direct link then between how energy efficient your building is and how much fossil fuels are burned. Yes, absolutely. Right, okay. So if they're going to bring in these new EPC rules, and it's not 100% yet, but assuming that they are, it's worthwhile landlords getting their ducks in a row now, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. And don't leave it to the last minute. Okay. So I mentioned that £16 billion figure there. It sounds very scary. Um, are there things that landlords can do to improve their EPC rating now that aren't going to cost them a fortune? Well, well yes, there are. Your average property in Britain has an EPC of D. So to go from an EPC of D to an EPC of C is not actually a huge leap. And there are lots of things you can do, landlords can do which aren't going to cost them an arm and a leg. So, for example, they can put in very good controls for, um, for the hot water system and the heating system in their property. They can have different zones heating different parts of their property. They can block up their chimneys. Um, and, so, and they can also put this much insulation in the loft. And all of those things added together will make a difference, will they? Yes, they will. They all add points to your EPC. Okay. I mean, you're a landlord yourself. Have you done this? I have done that, we have, we have done that, and we have done a lot more than that, yes. Okay. A so lot more than that. In, in, in short-term gains, how much of a difference will it make if you do all those, those things you just mentioned there? Well, it depends on the property that you have and the size of the property you have and all the other factors in the property, but they'll certainly give you quite a lot of points, and they may push you from a D to a C. Right, okay. So it can potentially be done, in the short-term at least, without costing you a bean. Well... 
to, 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 to buy and fit uh, this much loft insulation is going to cost something, but it's not going to cost an arm and a leg. Right, okay. A few hundred pounds. Yes. Right, okay. Yes, but the stuff around what you do with your boiler, for instance, that kind of thing is completely free. You can do that today. Well, adjusting the timers, um, if you need to arrange a plumber to come in to fit some controls, it will, it will, there'll be a cost for that. But again, it'll be uh, a small cost. So there is some low-hanging fruit that, that can be done for free. But what are the things that will cost a bit more money but will make a big difference longer term? The biggest impact things that a landlord can do to improve their energy efficiency and improve their EPC is to install underground floor insulation, wall insulation on the walls that face the outside, loft insulation which I've mentioned, and also insulation in the eaves. Plus install triple glazed windows and draft proof them and block up the chimneys. Also to install the most energy efficient boiler you possibly can, like an A++++. Really makes a massive difference to lowering energy bills, massive difference on increasing your EPC as well and also to fit solar PV panels with a battery so it can store the electricity that's generated during the day and use it at night and it can also give you free hot water uh, for any excess electricity that's not used. And you've done all this have you? Yes we have and that also will massively improve your EPC and reduce your electricity bills. It, what, what kind of order of change will that make? Well, it depends on how you actually consume the electricity in your property. So what we, did in our, what we did in our property was, my wife and I and our children, we would basically use all the kitchen appliances which use up the most amount of electricity during the day when the PV panels are working. So we had, we had free electricity for all the, all the heavy stuff. So that means running your washing machine? That yeah, washing machine, dryers, dishwashers, we had all that for free. And uh, using those appliances efficiently actually makes a difference as well, isn't it, for, for tenants when they're in the house. If they make sure that the washing machine is actually full, for instance, that can make a difference. Yes, it's very, ideally if, if all those kitchen appliances could be used when they're full, and also when the landlord buys a kitchen appliance, if they could buy the, an A++++ energy efficient appliance, which doesn't use much electricity in the first place. So there's a lot of different things that they can do, um, which will cost a few pounds to actually change the, the housing stock. Yes. A lot of landlords will not have that money ready to make those changes now. Are there, are there places you can go to, to to get help with making those changes? Yes, um, there are. In Scotland, the Scottish Government are giving loans and uh, interest-free loans and grants of up to £17,500 to landlords to make uh, energy efficiency improvements in their properties. Um, in the UK, you can apply for capital allowances up to 130%. For solar, to install solar PV panels. And the government have um, zero VAT rated um, most energy efficiency products. Now, we, we said that this is likely to come into play from 2025, but that's not actually rubber stamped by government yet. No. But you would recommend that these changes are worth making to your EPC rating, whatever the government does? Absolutely. I, I would certainly recommend that um, to get to see that uh, all landlords should do that uh, as soon as they possibly can, both in terms of helping the tenants who will then have lower energy bills, improving their energy rating and helping save the planet. So it's a win-win-win? It's a win-win-win, yes. Right, OK. Because th there may well be landlords watching this now who are thinking, well, it's going to cost me a lot of money to make these changes. I'd rather not do it and I'd rather put it off as long as possible. But your advice would be don't, don't do that, do it now. Don't do that, do it now. For the sake of the planet and for the sake of your tenants. Okay, hold that thought for a moment um, because potential rent arrears is something we want to talk about. While landlords are worrying about how to fund the EPC updates, there's another potential worry on the horizon of rent arrears. We did some research into the cost of living crisis. 13% of tenants say they have experienced a rent increase and are struggling to afford it. 11% said it was more important to them to pay their energy bills than it was to pay their rent. Now, while those figures may not seem too shocking on their own, consider these. 36% say that while they can afford to pay their bills now, they're concerned about the affordability in the future. And 40% said that they are unlikely to be able to afford any future increases in energy bills. 
17.8% saying they are already struggling to afford them. That's even before the new cap rises this month. So there's a lot of tenants who are struggling already and are worried about struggling in the future. So James, I mean, that's a concerning thing, obviously, for landlords. Very much so. You've got tenants yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a balance to be struck, isn't there, between um, making sure that, that, that tenants can actually afford to pay their bills mm -hmm. and pay their rent. Yes. What's your advice? Well, what we've done in our properties is we have done all, we've done all the measures which are no cost and low cost to improve energy efficiency, which includes removing um, all the sludge that builds up in the radiators. And it also involves enabling something called eco mode on, on boilers because the way boilers are programmed at the moment is that they, they're, always, they're, always, they're constantly burning gas to keep a bit of hot water there. So if somebody turns on the shower, they get hot water immediately. But that's a huge waste of energy that's not necessary. So we've enabled, the, we've enabled that eco mode. We've also sent our tenants a list of 20 things they can do themselves to reduce their energy usage. And the other thing is that um, you can change the temperature that flows around the radiators in a property. It's called the flow and return. So we, we reduce that for everybody as well. And the other thing is uh, we recommend that um, landlords can change, or well, the tenants can do it themselves actually, they could buy a low flow shower head which will reduce the, um, by 50% the amount of gas needed for hot water. Okay, how does it do that? A low flow shower head means that basically up to 50% less water is coming through that shower head. So, and the less water that comes through the shower head, the less gas that's needed to heat up that water in the first place. Right, okay, so straightforward is that. Yes. Um, and you mentioned 20 things that, that uh, tenants can actually do to be more energy efficient themselves. So what are the kind of recommendations that you've got around that? So things like when you're cooking on a stove, you, you, you put a lid on it, so you need a lot less gas or electricity to heat it up. If you're using um, a washing machine or, or a dryer or a, or a dishwasher, you, you wait till it's completely full. If they've got an eco mode, you select the eco mode. If you're just washing your hands, you wash them in cold water. If you're having a shower, you have a shower for under five minutes. Those kind of things. Lots of fairly Lots straightforward, of common sense kind of things, but maybe you just don't think about them. The, the other thing is, in London, a lot of houses have got a gap of half a centimetre under the front door. So the heating is just going out it's just it's literally you're it's posting a, money into the you're street. posting money into the streets and you know we, we got some some brush from b and q for five quid or something to stop that so those kind of things they they, yeah. they really do make a difference you're losing 20 percent of the heat in a building in drafts block up the drafts block up the drafts and the other thing is is to put loft insulation 50 centimeters 50 centimeters loft insulation of natural breathable loft insulation will reduce heating bills by 25 percent so there's a lot of relatively inexpensive ways that, that landlords can make Absolutely. changes to their property that will bring them up to a C. And you're saying it's not that difficult to reach that C rating? It's not difficult to reach a C rating if you're an average property of D. If you're at you know, F or E, then it's going to be harder and a bit more expensive. Yes. But you've done it with a, a Victorian era house, haven't you? We went from an F to 89 points, which is almost an A. Did that cost a lot of money to do that? Yes, it did. But it was worth it in your but it was opinion. worth it, because right. it was our home. And also, and we, wanted longer, to, we wanted to future-proof the house. Well, that's what I was going to say, that, that the, this EPC rating of going up to C may well be just the first step in a process that's going to go on over the next 20, 30 years, isn't it? Absolutely. The government have committed the UK to be at net zero by 2050. What that means is that in 28 years, all properties need to be at net zero, all of them. Land or properties, homeowner properties, social housing properties, all properties, we have got 28 years to do it. So if you're thinking about making changes to your property, you might be as well doing it sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Certainly the low hanging fruit stuff, get those done now. Why not? Why wait? Because we were just talking about the fact that you've got tenants who've got the you know, potential of having a a choice to make between paying their energy bills and paying their rent, that low hanging fruit stuff, you do that now before this winter, you can safeguard your future as a landlord, can't you? Absolutely. Another great idea for the tenants is to actually uh, install uh, an electricity monitor. So the tenants can actually see in real time when they turn on the dryer or an oven or the kettle, they can see exactly how much electricity they're using. And that 
alone, that single thing alone, will encourage a change in behaviour and get people to reduce their electricity consumption. Now, something that's uh, worth mentioning here is uh, rent guarantee insurance. Um, it was something that was taken off the shelves during the course of the, uh, the pandemic, but um, I think it's probably fair to say a lot of landlords may regret having let that lapse. Um, we could be finding ourselves on the edge of another rent arrears crisis. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that insurance is actually worth having? I find the rent guarantee insurance invaluable and I've been using it for years in lots of my properties because it does two things. First of all, it will pay out uh, on rent that's not paid by the tenants. And secondly, more importantly, it will cover your legal fees, which could be far more than the rent that they're not paying you. So yes, I think it's a very good product. It's a tax deductible expense and it's a no brainer. Right, okay. And that's I would a, highly recommend it. That's a fairly ringing endorsement, right, excellent. Yeah. Um, so as we sort of draw this bit of the conversation to a close then, James, what is the, the single key message that you really want to get out to landlords around energy efficiency with their houses? I, we would suggest that landlords do Im implement all the no cost and very low cost energy efficiency measures immediately. We'd also suggest that they educate their tenants on all the simple things that tenants can do themselves, like feed the radiators, for example. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a sort of a win, 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 actually, because first of all, if the tenants' energy bills are lower, it means that they've got more money to pay the rent, so there'll be less arrears. It means that the tenants themselves will have lower bills, so they'll be less under pressure. It means that the landlord's EPC will improve, and it means that we will be helping save the planet. It's something that really needs to be done now. Passionate about that, aren't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to make a difference, isn't it? James, thank you ever so much for being with us today. James Hanna, our energy efficiency expert. And James is going to be uh, staying online in our Q&A box. If you want to put your questions directly to him, then you can do that during the course of the rest of the afternoon until five o'clock. So as we've seen, upgrading your property to lower your energy bills and meet the EPC ratings could potentially mean a fair amount of work on your property and that could have an impact on your insurance. In what way? We're joined by our insurance expert, Matthew Crawley, who's got 15 years experience in this area. Matthew, thanks ever so much for being with Thank us. Thank you. So if you're making changes to your property, do you need to inform your insurer? It's going to be dependent on the situation realistically. I mean, if it's something as simple as changing a light bulb to an LED light bulb, then no, you don't need to make us aware. But if it's something that's going to be more structural, say putting insulation into walls or changing aspects that way, then yes, we would need to know because it is going to in increase the risk to the insurers. Okay, so it's a fairly straightforward rule of thumb then. If it's a little thing, if it's just something like, as you say, changing yep. a light bulb, don't worry about it, yep. that's not the issue. It's if you're actually knocking walls down, making structural changes to the property. Not necessarily just structural changes, but again, something a bit a bit over and above changing a light bulb. It's a situation that we need to make insurers wear as soon as possible, because the worst thing that can happen is that there is a claim in that situation. Unfortunately, you would have invalidated your policy if you haven't let them know that there's tradesmen in there and walls are coming down and installations going in. So it's best to be safe than sorry. Okay, so if you do knock walls down or you put insulation in the loft and that kind of thing, what uh, impact could that then have on your insurance? So it's going to be a case that potentially if you don't make your insurers aware of the works that are going on, say there is a burst pipe or an escape of water claim, th there is a likelihood that unfortunately the insurers would not pay out on that. Okay, but let's assume then that you do go through the process of improving your property and you, you sort of you know take the odd wall down and you put some uh, in insulation in the loft and that kind of thing and you don't tell your insurer, what are the risks around doing that? The risk around that is that if there is a claim of any salt saver up in the loft putting insulation in, a pipe's burst and it comes through the ceiling, if the insurers are not made aware of that situation, the likelihood is that they're not going to pay out on your claim. It's going to leave you out of pocket, but also tenants may have to move out in that situation as well, which is going to cost you a lot more. So again, it's just making sure that should the worst happen, your insurer is aware of what's going on. So should there be a claim, it can be covered. All right, okay. So for a landlord, it really is in their best interest to just let the insurer know. Definitely, most definitely. Excellent, Matthew, thank you very much for being with us. Well, I've moved over now into the Mashroom newsroom because all the turmoil in the financial markets over the last couple of weeks have led to steep interest rate rises 
and incredible uncertainty in the mortgage industry. Record numbers of mortgage products have been taken off the market. Last week, the financial information service Money Facts said that 935 mortgage products were taken off the shelf overnight in just 24 hours. More than 1,600 have now been removed in total in order to reprice them. So let's take a look at some of the facts and figures around that. On Tuesday, the 27th of September, these lenders suspended their mortgage offers for new customers. HSBC, Santander, the Post Office, Skipped and Building Society and Virgin Money. And that's because, according to Lucian Cook, who's the head of residential research at estate agency Savills, fixed rate mortgages are now incredibly difficult to price at the moment because of the continued uncertainty over interest rates. The day before, on Monday the 26th of September, the Bank of England issued a statement saying that it would not hesitate to raise interest rates after the pound hit record lows following the Chancellor's mini-budget in the previous week. The drop in the number of mortgage products currently available was the biggest daily drop ever recorded, double the previous biggest ever daily drop that was seen during the pandemic. 2,661 mortgage products are currently available which is actually just half the number that were on sale of December 2021 when interest rates first began to rise. Previous forecasts had suggested that interest rates might hit 4% by next May. Economists are now predicting that interest rates could more than double from where they are now to 5.8% by April 2023. If interest rates do rise, as predicted, then Samuel Toombs, who's the chief UK economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics, said that would mean that monthly payments for an average household refinancing coming off the back of a two-year fixed rate mortgage will almost double, up from £863 to £1,490. Well, I'm joined now by uh, Robert Winfield, who's a mortgage specialist here at Mashroom, so we can really understand how this is actually going to affect the mortgage market and hopefully provide some reassurance to you guys watching. So what then does this all mean to people who've already got a mortgage, if they've got a fixed rate mortgage or whatever product and they've got it in place at the moment? Uh, hopefully some reassurance for them. Um, we all know we've seen a market trend uh, effectively interest is, or interest rates have increased over the last six months. Um, if they've locked in anywhere in that period or previously then they can sit pretty to be honest. We'd like to feel um, that we, we uh, there is no crystal ball, we don't know what's going to happen in the future but they are safe for... Uh, okay see. but if you're on a tracker mortgage different situation. Exactly. Uh, if we were to lightly advise, or see each circumstance is different depending on the, the customer and their current tracker or how that arrangement looks. But if we do follow market trend, it would suggest that it's best to get something locked in sooner rather than later. Like I've said, the last six months has only seen an increase. So that would suggest that's going to continue while inflation is still skyrocketing. OK, there will be quite a lot of people who've maybe got another year or so, six months yeah. maybe on their fixed rate mortgage and who will be thinking, I don't know what to do, stick or twist. Yeah, the um, million dollar question, to be honest. Uh, very difficult from an advice standpoint to um, give any form of guidance. Like I said, I'd be a millionaire if I had a crystal ball that could tell me what that would look like. Uh, we'd say best to speak to a broker, at least look at your circumstance. If you don't have big tie-ins, then it's maybe worth changing, jumping ship, or at least changing your mortgage product with your current bank. Um, if you've got a big early repayment charge uh, or ERCs as they're referred to, then once again, it's going to be very difficult to make a, a judgment call on each individual case. There isn't really a right plan of action. And in 12 months time, we might be in a different position. In 12 months time, who knows where we're going to be. It's, it's exactly. interesting times, as they say, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. Um, so let's look more specifically then at, at buy-to-let mortgages okay. and landlords, because obviously that's the, our primary audience yeah. today, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. um, how are they likely to be affected? Um, from experience, what we've done so far, we've seen a lot of our landlords, if they have had to, let's say, remortgage or have been directly impacted by the interest increases, most of those costs have been, unfortunately, moved on to the tenants. Um, obviously, inflation suggests rising rental prices. They can justify a higher rental. 
their mortgages coming up, they're not looking to make any more money, they're just looking to make the same money, which unfortunately is then all rolls down, doesn't it? Water falls onto the tenant, their rent increases because the landlord's mortgage has increased. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they're in a fixed rate, then they're just going to reap the rewards. Their payment's not going to change for the next two to five years, but they are going to see that increase in rental. So some of them are quite happy about it, to be honest, make the, the, the best of a, a bad situation. Right, OK. So let's look at people then who are genuinely concerned because they're looking at the fact that things are going to be changing in terms of their mortgage payments and they're yeah. worried about whether they're actually going to be able to afford their mortgage going forward. Yeah, um, everyone's human. The banks are aware of that but at the end of the day they're human as well and I think everyone sees them as quite a clinical operation every lender is clinical like I said they understand that everyone is human and financial hard hardship does hit so ironically COVID was um, where we saw a lot of the mortgage holidays step in so that's a possibility people were taking three to six month breaks with their lender once again it's unique to each circumstance we, we will give generic advice not individual don't take it as gospel but there is that option just to approach the lender and say, look, it's really going to be difficult. Can we at least have a look at a mortgage holiday? Uh, it's written into most uh, illustrations, maybe not known. Um, can I say COVID highlighted that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, like I said, the, we will always advise speak to your lender. Right. Don't let something just default. Don't, don't start hide missing away. payments. Don't yeah. put your head in the sand, be exactly an ostrich that. about it. Do have the conversation. Exactly that. Like I said, they're human at the end, on, on the other end of the phone. They will understand that, like I said, we are in unprecedented times at the moment. So approach them. They want you to be up front. They will put as many things in place as they can before they need to t introduce any legal work. If you are head in the sand and miss a payment, that's going to have a, a much more detrimental long-term effect on credit score, reliability with the lender it's a slippery slope once okay. uh, you're not transparent so a big set of stuff that we've been talking about today has been around epcs and yes. uh, investing money in making your properties uh, more energy efficient and yeah. future proofing and all those kind of things some of the stuff you can do very cheaply some of the stuff is going to cost a few quid depending yeah. on what you choose to do is it possible to finance making those changes as a landlord through remortgaging potentially yes once again, circumstantial, if there's a lot of money tied up in the property and you think I've got a five to £10,000 bill coming for a new set of windows, doors, whatever that looks like. We've had our EPC expert or energy performance expert on, so I'm sure they've covered it. Um, you can, if you've got the equity in the property, borrow it from the lender to make home improvements. Uh, once again, it's based on the each individual it may be feasible, it may not be feasible. There's there's a lot of criteria, boring stuff that we no. have to cover off with them first. Well, it is important though, isn't yeah, it? And, and what you, but, but making those changes, yeah. given the fact that rate rises are changing, you, you really need to have that conversation to work out whether it's in your benefit or not. Um, yes, there's, I mean, there's a few different options. You can ironically go to your bank and approach them direct for what we call additional borrowing, um, which only the additional borrowing would be on the higher interest rate. If you've got a cracking rate, don't move your whole mortgage to another bank and go on to a rate that's two or three times that because that really would be difficult to advise. Additional borrowing a £10,000 lump sum, grand scheme of things from a mortgage perspective, that's not a huge amount of money. Um, just that additional would be on the higher uh, interest rate. Your, let's say, £200,000 mortgage would remain on its current. So, And then personal loan, that's also an option. You don't always have to go through um, the mortgage arm, you can always do it uh, just through a separate bank or who your debit card's with. Still an option to There's fund lots those of options. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Rob, thanks ever so much for, for being with us. Well, that's it for the New Look Mashroom show this week. Thank you to our expert guests, James Tanner, Matthew Crawley and Robert Winfield for their brilliant insight. And thank you all so much for joining us and for all your comments and questions. We really appreciate them. Don't forget our Q&A panel is still open. We'll be taking your questions until five o'clock in the Facebook community space. So head on over there if there's still something that you want to know. But be sure to check out our website next week as we continue to talk about the points that you're raising here. We'll be back with the next edition on Friday, the 21st of October. Don't forget to join the community. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.